already. Let's see. Um, before starting, I wanted to um, mention something that I had neglected to mention before. We were talking about the geophysical attributes of Antarctica and also the polar regions. And I had mentioned that the, that the attenuation length in the polar region, the radio waves, was about one to two kilometers. In fact, that attenuation length depends critically on the temperature of the ice. And if I were to make a plot of the temperature, so this is temperature versus depth into the ice sheet, then typically it would look uh, something, something like this. And the, let's go the other way. So, okay. And at the depth that corresponds to the bedrock, the very bottom of the ice sheet, the temperature is around, it's around the melting point. And at the surface, depending on where you are in Antarctica, the temperature, for instance, at the South Pole is about minus 55 degrees centigrade in the winter. Uh, and in fact, it's during the summer, of course, it's warmer. During the summer on the surface, it gets up to maybe minus 40 degrees centigrade. But you don't have to go very far into the ice sheet before the temperature stabilizes. For instance, if you probe a distance of only three meters into the ice sheet, the temperature three meters into the ice sheet is within a couple of degrees of a constant value of about minus, <clears throat> minus 54 degrees centigrade. It's remarkable how stable it is at such a shallow depth. Now, this is for um, this is for the South Pole, and pretty much everywhere in the Antarctic continent that we have data for, the temperature profile with depth looks similar. So this would be the surface. This would be surface. And this would be a depth of, say, uh, 2,800 meters, or wherever, wherever the bedrock is. So if you were to go to Vostok, it would have the same shape. The surface temperature would be at about minus 60 degrees centigrade. But at the bottom, it would be close to zero degrees centigrade. If you were to go to West Antarctica, and remember that West Antarctica is important because West Antarctica is where the ice is moving so rapidly. West Antarctica is where the ice sheet has a flow rate of up to a kilometer a year. And there, the, the flow rate is very dependent on this temperature, as you can imagine. Because if the temperature is very close to zero, that means that water will form underneath the ice sheet and you'll get a lubricating layer that will facilitate the ice flow. And because of that, there's, and that's, that, that's one of these feedback mechanisms that people talk about in terms of global warming. So in a place like West Antarctica, we know that the, um, the temperature near the bedrock is getting warmer. Because the temperature is getting warmer near the bedrock, there's more and more water that's, that's, that's forming. Because there's more and more water, it makes it easier for the ice sheet as a whole to flow over it. And there's more loss of ice mass. The same is true of Greenland. However, in Greenland, 
What's very odd is that the highest point in Greenland is at a place called Summit. So Summit, as the name suggests, is the highest point on Greenland, on the Greenland, uh, Greenland ice sheet. The ice there has a depth of about 3.5 kilometers. And what's very, very curious is that the profile of the, um, the ice temperature with depth looks very odd. It starts like this, and then it actually goes like this. So, it doesn't make any sense, but this temperature profile has now been measured in two places in Greenland. And what it means is that the surface temperature, for instance, summit, is about minus 35 degrees centigrade. But if you go about one kilometer, yeah, it, as you go as you go deeper, the temperature. Let's see, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. So, as you go deeper into the ice sheet, you get to a point where the ice starts to get colder. It's very, very odd, but it's been measured in two places. And there's no obvious physical mechanism that would cause this. In principle, there's only, you know, if there's a source of heat at the bottom, and there is heat which is being lost at the top. And there's no reason why if you drill into the ice to a depth of about one kilometer, the ice is getting colder. And it's a very odd effect. And people have come up with various reasons why this is true, but they're, very all, they're all very ad hoc. You have to have some mechanism for trapping cold, you know, trapping the cold, preventing the preventing heat from diffusing out of that layer. But in any case, this is something which has been seen in, in Greenland. Um, so, getting back to the radio frequency attenuation length, the radio frequency attenuation length is long when the ice is very cold. So, this attenuation length, L10, at minus 50 degrees centigrade, is about uh, two kilometers. At zero degrees centigrade, it's about 200 meters. But by extension, by extrapolation, if I think about the attenuation length, for instance, on Europa. What is the attenuation length for, uh, for zero, for, for zero, for water? Uh, the, well, the attenuation length, th this would be in ice. This for ice. And this is the attenuation length for radio. Radio waves. The uh, attenuation length, one, I, once ice changes to water, then the attenuation length becomes maybe a meter or so. Is it, uh, of course, uh, it depends on the frequency and the... It depends on frequency, so this is at 300 megahertz, mm -hmm. for instance. But if I extend this argument and think about, for instance, um, one of the moons of Saturn, or Jupiter, Ganymede, or Callisto, or Europa, where people are planning on doing measurements of those ice there, the temperature is something like minus 150 degrees centigrade. And there, the attenuation lanes could be something like, you know, 20 to 30 kilometers. So you have very good clarity of vision into those ice sheets. However, there may be large impurities. It may not be pure ice. It's likely to be dirtier than the ice we have even in Hammer. Okay, that was that was a long aside. Okay, so today I'm gonna I'm gonna try to start the discussion 
uh, the actual experiments and in point of fact the experiments that we do. Um, and what we're concerned with are mostly um, cosmic rays. Uh, and of course cosmic rays are familiar to us in everyday life. There are, um, there are strong reasons to believe that cosmic rays are what trigger lightning strikes. If you make a calculation of the potential difference between a cloud and the ground in a typical storm, and you compare that with the breakdown voltage of air, typically, you find that you don't, that the breakdown voltage is too high. So you need something to incite the breakdown, plasma breakdown. And these guys, Burbage and Zeeben, um, made this reasonable um, hypothesis that what triggers lightning strikes is, in fact, um, cosmic rays, which are basically imparting charge to, um, to incite a, um, a lightning strike. Of course, in Kansas, where I live, we have lots of lightning strikes and lots of storms. This was the unfortunate um, consequence of a particularly bad storm that um, there was a huge storm that formed over the city of Greensburg, Kansas. And uh, this is what was left about four years later after um, every tornado swept through. As you can see, the, um, the landscape is extraordinarily attractive. Um, there are many features to the landscape that allow you to make lots of picture postcards. That's not very pretty at all. Uh, and in fact, at the telescope array, they've done this experiment where they have measured um, extensive air showers and they compare the trigger time of an extensive air shower with the observation of lightning. Well, it turns out, I don't know if it's done here, but at least in the US, somehow they keep a record, they keep a tabulation. They record all of the lightning strikes that occur. So you can just make a coincidence between the time of a lightning strike and the time that this telescope array experiment measured an ultra high energy um, air shower. And this is the coincidence time, or this is the time difference between the appearance of lightning and the appearance of an air shower. And clearly, there's a correlation between them, which supports the idea that to some extent, lightning strikes are indeed caused by and triggered by cosmic ray induced air showers. Um, for those of you who are interested, you've probably seen this, but if you have a smartphone, you can use your smartphone as a, as a cosmic ray detector. Um, there's an iPhone app, which is out of um, University of California, Irvine, I believe. And there's a, another one which is out of the University of Wisconsin, which is called DECO, which is with what I'm familiar with. And it will, it'll basically just record um, cosmic rays for you. Now, in point of fact, most of the stuff that it's registering is background, but it has some way of filtering out noise. And you can, if you're interested, you can you can download um, download the uh, the source code onto your Android. Um, it also has a way. So it's just using your um, so your camera. Of course, it's just a, a pixelated CCD. And of course, if you think about any CCD, tracks going through it have different signatures. So this, for instance, is what a muon track would look like, and this is what an electron track would look like, and it actually has pattern recognition um, software. Now, in fact, it seems like it's for amusement, but if you think about 
the fact that pretty much everybody, except myself, has a smartphone. Um, and if you think about the rate at which extensive air showers or ultra high energy particles are striking the earth, and if you add up all of the CCD coverage, you take the CCD coverage of a typical smartphone, and you multiply that by all the smartphones, you actually get a large aerial acceptance. So it seems very, you know, it seems like it's, like I said, it's mostly amusement, but in fact, in principle, and of course, the people that own uh, Apple will be very glad to hear this. Um, in principle, you can think about possibly doing actual science with this. So your data, as it's recorded, is fed into a central database, and then there is some graduate student who is sitting in a basement room with no light, who is trying to make sense out of all the data. But in any case, so this is, yeah, this is courtesy of current era. Okay, so plots or pictures that you've seen before. This is the epic beginning of cosmic ray astronomy, the famous picture of uh, Victor Hess. Um, although I actually confess I have not seen a picture of Victor Hess. So this is 19, 1912. Um, I have not seen a picture of actually Victor Hess in the air with the balloon. Um, probably he jumped out and one of his underpaid, hungry students had to jump in and do the work themselves. Um, and this is Victor Hess, Hess feeling the love and affection and adoration of the Austrian peasantry at the time. Uh, and he finds very curiously that the ionization rate exposed uh, increases with um, altitude. Now, the standard explanation, well, you know, where could particles be coming from? The obvious explanation is that particles are coming from the sun. And he did something very clever, which is he also made an ascent during a solar eclipse and showed that the ionization rate remained more or less constant. And in that way, he demonstrated that cosmic rays that he was observing were in fact not coming from sun, not pretty clever. Uh, and he got a Nobel Prize, that's good. Um, Pierre Auger, uh, 25 years later, uh, detects extensive air showers, and what he did was he went one step beyond what Victor Hess had done. He took uh, essentially the equivalent of um, scintillator receivers, and he displaced them, he moved them apart from each other, and he registered coincidences. And from that, it was obvious that he was seeing more than one particle, and he deduced that the particles that he was observing were the result of interactions in the atmosphere that were causing subsequent debris. And that was what was being observed, and in fact, he actually was able to make an estimate of the likely energy of the particles that he was observing, the primary particles, and that estimate was probably pretty close to real. Now, this is the European way of doing things. So, in Europe, you get into a balloon and you control the, the peasantry in um, in France, you take two scintillators and you put them on the ground and you wait for cosmic rays to come to you. Of course, in America, we do things differently. And in America, we go to the cosmic ray. You don't just put stuff on the ground and wait for things to come to you. You attack the cosmic ray. And that's illustrated here in this very famous uh, journal article. So this is the American approach to cosmic ray detection from 1961. And here are um, four scientists. This is what you would look like if you had been a scientist in 1961. 
And like all scientists, they're interested in understanding the unknown. But as Americans are prone to be, that means taking, taking risks. And in this case, what they did is they decided that they were going to uh, study cosmic rays the hard way, the American way. So what did they do? Well, they decide they are going to essentially steal and commandeer a Saturn V rocket. And fortunately, in America, as everywhere else in the world, the guards are often looking the other way, except in Russia, of course. And so they get into their rocket ship, and their rocket ship is hurtling up into the sky. And as all scientists or ordinary people might, there's some amount of concern, some amount of fear, because they know that they're out about to um, interact with cosmic rays, and up till that point, nobody knows what will happen. And sure enough, um, the cosmic rays, if this ever happens to you, if you're flying too high in the air, you'll know, because as these cosmic rays are bouncing off the side of your Saturn V rocket, you'll hear this sound. You hear this rat tech 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 bouncing off the side. And uh, this is what they this is what they look like. And then, unfortunately, again, science is you know an enterprise of risk taking. And then, unfortunately, um, bad things happen to scientists. This guy turns into a, uh, a human flame. Um, this guy, unfortunately, just becomes disfigured and unattractive. Um, but nevertheless, despite this awful thing that has happened to him, he realizes that he has to use his new powers to help mankind. That's the American way. Uh, so this is the American approach to um, to, uh, to cosmic wave physics. And then, of course, there's this Bruce Banner, who, of course, had his own unfortunate um, interlude with, uh, with gamma rays, which you're all familiar with. Okay. Um, one other con consequence of, real consequence of cosmic rays is that if you look at the cancer rates of, for instance, um, of pilots, um, the cancer rates in airline pilots are typically elevated relative to the general population. I think it's mostly um, skin cancer, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and, and they've in fact done studies where they've looked at the, um, they've looked at the blood uh, cells of, what is this called? Vision not only Estancia. You know what it is, ISS. How do you say it, Hashim? Okay. Um, and in fact, what you see is that after spending some amount of time, you see an enhanced number of these um, so-called dicentric uh, chromosomes, which are just chromosomes that have just split um, anomalously. Now this, of course, is a biological experiment which we're doing in real time. And of course, nobody knows how this will, you know, end up in another 20 or 30 years. Um, our great president, um, George Bush, uh, had this proposal to send a man to Mars uh, in this was 2004. This was to divert the country's attention from his other failed policies. And, um, and of course, what he forgot to mention is that those brave astronauts that decided to fly from, uh, from Cape Canaveral in Florida all the way to Mars would likely take a lethal dose of radiation. Um, so you get a big chunk of radiation on the way there, and you get a big chunk of radiation while you're staying there uh, as well. So this is... This is a technical barrier that remains to be um, remains to be bridged. You can, of course, get around this a little bit in the standard particle physics way. You can just make the 
hull of your rocket ship thicker, but then you run into problems because now you have more weight to lift off of the launch pad. So this is an issue which still remains to be remains to be solved. Okay, um, as a prelude to at least some of the some of the experiments that I've been involved with. Uh, I'll mention, and as a prelude to a lot of the neutrino experimentation that goes on today, um, I'll mention these two guys who you probably have seen pictures of. Uh, so this is Markov and Pontecorvo, who I mentioned before. Um, and Markov is often credited with the idea of using um, natural media, such as water or even ice, as a place to do uh, neutrino astronomy, which of course has developed into um, to quite an industry today. And in fact, um, I should mention that in um, 1987, they actually had a, um, a prototype effort at Station Vostok. It was a prototype effort to do radio wave detection of neutrinos uh, that unfortunately fell off the cliff in, um, in 1991 for, for obvious reasons. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk probably for the rest of the period today, about some of the current experiments that we're involved with, uh, both in ice and out of ice. Here's a random sampling of what non-ice experiments look like. So if you just go to the website of three very prominent um, current astronomy and astroparticle physics experiment websites and download pictures, here's a picture of uh, the, an OGEN experiment detector. This is their Cherenkov uh, detector. Here is a picture that you can just pull off of a LOFAR um, experiment. This is a set of radio um, radio receivers based in the Netherlands, and they do uh, they do radio wave detection of ultra high energy cosmic rays. And so this is the Netherlands. This is Argentina. And this is um, here in Russia. So this is um, Tunga Valley, about 100 kilometers southwest of um, Irkutsk. Uh, and it's obvious that in order to do these experiments, you need not only good infrastructure, but also um, lots of large domestic animals. Um, and why that is the case uh, is not clear, but if you are designing such an experiment, um, you'll have to take that into, take that into account. <clears throat> I don't know why that's the case. It seems odd. All right, so if you, if you think about doing um, cosmic ray astronomy, what are the particles that in principle you can measure? Well, you can measure protons, you can measure neutrons, um, you can measure, uh, in principle, electrons, but the mean free path for an electron is so small that the likelihood of it getting from far away to here is very, also very small. Gamma rays, um, you can measure, of course, neutrinos, and you can measure nuclei. And that's about it. Anything that's going to hit the Earth from somewhere far away is likely going to be one of these one of these five things. So let's start with nuclei. The obvious question to ask is: Is the distribution of mass here around the solar system the same as the distribution of mass beyond the solar system? So what you can do is you can measure the atomic composition locally on the Earth and around the Earth, and that's shown here. And you can compare that with what you measure coming from without the solar system. So you can measure what's bombarding the solar system, and that's shown here. And on the whole, they line up fairly well, but you set with the exception of this region in here. Any idea why galactic cosmic rays would have more beryllium, for instance, or 
lithium or boron than we see in the solar system. Does anyone know why this is? Sorry? The sun is an older star. The sun is an older star. Um, not quite. Um, it's actually, it's not that this distribution is, wait, so how does that work? You're saying the sun is an older star, and because of that, the, the material from which the solar system came looks like this. And what we're seeing are objects that were created uh, more recently. Uh, no, I mean, this, the, in, in the sun, the sun is, is uh, most of the life material is already burned. Uh, so oh, you're saying... The second generation star. The sun is a second generation star, so the light component is... Oh, I see. You're, you're saying that, 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 that previous generations of stars have burned up all the light stuff. Oh. Uh, it's good, good thinking. Um, but, and it's probably true to some extent. However, this is actually, remember, this is about five orders of magnitude. And recycling that sort of material won't, won't, won't give you that much of an effect. Um, it's at, well, I happen to know the answer, that's why, so I put the slide here, so I can show you how smart I am. Um, it's actually that, that this, a lot of this stuff is the result of nuclear ablation. So what happens is that you start out with a high energy cosmic ray from very, very far away, and along the path between the source and here on the Earth, it strikes a heavier um, nucleus and basically fragments that nucleus. So when it breaks up that, um, that heavier nucleus, you get lots of small chunks, which are just these, these lighter nuclei. In English, it's called um, ablation. It must be the same word. Same word, okay. It is the same word. Okay, so the enhancement, the increase in this yield is just the result of um, fragmenting of heavy nuclei along the way. Now, this is in the range between 1 to 10 GeV um, per nuclei, and there are lots of studies that have been, so this is another way of presenting the same data. All right, and here is, here is a compilation of, um, so this is, so there, there are basically two ways that experiments are done. There's something like, I lost my, okay, so there are experiments which seek to measure nuclei such as this one, and here, what they're measuring are things like the, yeah. So they measure the so-called mean logarithmic mass. So the mean logarithmic mass is just the, it's just a measure of how heavy the average nuclei are that are incident on the Earth. And as the energy increases, the mean logarithmic mass also increases. So things are getting heavier, then, you go here, if you fast forward to the full cosmic ray spectrum, so now I'm taking everything, and it's mostly protons, now I have something that looks like this. This is another form of a plot that you've almost certainly seen before, and there are various components. There is a component from within the galaxy, and there's a component that comes from outside of the galaxy, and there are also these features called the knee, which you know, uh, the second knee, which you may not know, and the ankle, so the knee and the babushka. All right, and of course, how do we determine whether or not a cosmic ray can come from, for instance, the galaxy or from without the galaxy? Well, it's very simple. 
For any cosmic ray, there is a quantity, for any charged particle, there is a quantity which is called the Larmor radius, which you're familiar with. And the Larmor radius just is a measure of the largest radius at which a charged particle, if you like, can be confined in a given magnetic field. So, very crudely, I just said mv squared over r equals qvb, and that tells me that the um, that uh, momentum is something like qdr. So, if I take the product of a of the momentum times the confining radius, or sorry, the magnetic field, magnetic field times the confining radius, that gives me a measure of the um, momentum, or the maximum momentum, that a particle can be confined in for that particular magnetic field and that, that radius. And for our own Milky Way, the limit given the known magnetic field of the Milky Way, which is on the order of 10 to the minus 7th or 10 to the minus 8th Gauss, depending on where you are, that limit is about 10 to the 16th, 10 to the 17th electron volts or so. Okay, um, and that's all summarized in this plot called the, the Hillis plot. So the Hillis plot is a two-dimensional plot, which you've probably seen before, which um, plots on one axis the magnetic field of a possible source in the sky versus the sit scale, the size of that source. And in order to get very, very high energy particles, you need to have the product of B times R be sufficiently high that you can reach 10 to the 20th electron volt. So for instance, you can have neutron stars, which are small, R is on the order of 10 kilometers, but the magnetic fields are huge. The magnetic fields are, are so large, you know, 10 to the 7 Tesla, that it compensates for the small size, and this product is large enough that you can get up to 10 to the 20th electron volts. So when you see when you see particles of these very, very high energies, and you ask, where can these particles come from? Well, the simplest thing to do is to just, if you know the magnetic field and you know the size, you just calculate this quantity, and it will tell you whether or not that part, that source, can account for the energy that's, that's observed, observed at Earth. So what we're concerned with are, of course, the, um, the very highest energy protons, the very high, highest energy particles. All right, the, um, so the typical sources that people mention are not only neutron stars, but also these things called active galactic nuclei. And these are all basically, so there's many, many words for these, um, but uh, there are different forms of the same sort of the same sort of mechanism. So, here, for instance, in um, a so-called blazar, there is a there's a supermassive black hole at the center. There's this accretion disk, and there is this jet that is spewing stuff outwards. And depending on where the Earth is oriented relative to the jet, you see a a different image. The mechanism of for getting high energy particles out is not direct, it's through uh, shock, shock generation, if you're probably familiar with. Um, a gamma ray burst, of course, is a different object, but again, it's a way of generating a large shock that in, capable, that in principle may be capable of generating these very high energy cosmic rays. Okay, here is a picture of of an AGN. So here, here the jets are pretty obvious. Uh, and here are here are some others. Okay. So and as I said before, depending on what your 
um, viewing angle is, you get a different image of the internal dynamics, and these all have just different names, but they're different ways of describing, ultimately, the, um, the same object. Okay, shock acceleration, we'll talk about, let's see, okay, yeah, shock acceleration, we'll talk about in a second. Um, one of the one of the distinguishing features of the cosmic ray spectrum is that it follows a so-called power law. So the n by the e, the e is something like e to a constant exponent, and the uh, the number of ways you can generate a power law spectrum is very limited. Um, and this is clearly non-thermal, and the most obvious candidate is, um, is through uh, shock acceleration. All right, um, there is also, so complementary to ultra-high energy cosmic rays that are mostly protons, perhaps some nuclei, there are of course experiments that measure, that measure uh, gamma rays, such as the Fermi uh, lat experiment, and I won't talk about these too much. Um, you probably know that um, the gamma ray bursts are one of the great scientific uh, discoveries left over from the Cold War. They were discovered by American satellites that were intended to measure um, um, nuclear explosions, which of course are not to be seen anyway. Um, and I'll move fast through this. Okay, so. So there's experiments that measure uh, gamma rays, which again, because of the time limitations, I'm going, I'm going to skip. So let's start out with um, detection of a ultra high energy proton. So what would, it, if we were to model a one joule proton, so this is a 1.6 times 10 to the 19 electron volt proton interacting in the upper atmosphere, what does the shower look like? Okay, so here's a little time lapse photography. So, and the time, you can see, is relative to impact on the ground. So here is the original particle, and then the, um, the subsequent particles will be, the particles in the shower are color-coded, so as you're watching it, electrons and positrons will be in blue, uh, photons and cyan, and neutrons in red, and muons in green, and this whole thing evolves, and this is what it looks like when it gets to the ground. So here's this, here's this footprint on the ground, and there are, of course, lots of particles that are spread out by the, once they get to a low enough uh, momentum, of course, they're uh, essentially taken over by the Earth's magnetic field. Um, but otherwise, in the core, there's a very large energy and concentrated charge source. Okay, so this is what this is what the various particle species look like. And even though it seems very uh, complicated, there's a very simple model which people use to estimate the basic properties of this sort of a shower. And even though we started out with a, um, even though the initial particle is a proton, we can use this model, which is called the Heitler model, to, as I said before, give us a very qualitative view of how the shower is developing. So what we'll do is we'll, um, we'll model the shower as an electromagnetic, by its electromagnetic evolution. And we'll imagine that we start out with uh, the case where very high in the atmosphere, most of the energy is in, for instance, an electron. So here's the upper atmosphere. Here's the Earth's surface. And let's suppose we have some charged particle. And in this case, we'll say it's an electron. Now, it's obviously not an electron. It's a proton. But nevertheless, for the purposes of modeling, we can focus on, say, the first electron, that first electron that's produced as representative of the electromagnetic component of the shower. So the electron uh, starts, and then it goes one radiation length. 
goes one radiation length, and the electron will undergo Bremsstrahlung. So here we go to E gamma. And then we go two radiation lanes, and then the gamma pair produces E plus C minus. Then this electron again Bremsstrahlungs. And then you see how this is going. Uh, so this, again, this goes to E gamma once more, this goes to E plus A minus, and this goes to E plus gamma, and so on and so forth. Okay, it's a very simple model. And the number of, it's called a hydro model, and the number of particles at any depth is just obviously given by uh, so n at some depth is proportional to to the n, where n is the number of radiation lanes. Okay. So, given this model, given this very simple model, I can make qualitative and even quantitative predictions. So for instance, I can do the following. I can ask, as, as the shower is developing, the average energy is decreasing of all the particles, and at some point, the average energy, E, which is just equal to E0 over 2 to the n, at some point, this average energy per particle becomes small enough that the energy losses through Bremsstrom become smaller than the energy losses through ionization. And perhaps you know what that point is called. You know what that's called? So as the shower is developing, there's a point where the losses due to Bremsstrom become smaller than the losses due to electrons that are bouncing, that are ionizing atoms. Are you familiar with this? What is, what is that called, you know? Sorry? Everybody knows. You do know, right? Do these guys know? Critical energy, sure. So, at some point, you reach the critical energy, and at that point, the average energy due to ionization loss is less than the ionization energy, is less than the energy due to um, uh, Bremsstrahlung. And if you just look at this expression, then it's clear that I think to the end, by asking at that point, which also corresponds to quote unquote shower max, I can write D critical is equal to E naught, and clearly if I take the log of both sides, 2 plus log C, I see immediately that the, so N, remember, is, the, is now the number of radiation lanes to get to shower max, and it's very clear that N varies logarithmically with the primary energy. So again, even though this model is very simple, it nevertheless has some, has some predictive power and is in fact very useful as a, um, as a way of illustrating the basic qualitative features of shower development. Okay, so there's lots of different particles. There's electrons and positrons and muons and photons. So to do this in a coherent way, what you do is you stack up lots of different detector types in order to catch them all. All right. And, okay, this is the critical energy. Yes, this I have already talked about. All right. And here again is the, um, here again is the cosmic ray spectrum um, plotted in, now what I've done is that I haven't, I haven't boosted the cosmic ray spectrum by a factor of e squared. So this is the, by a factor of e cubed, is the cosmic ray spectrum only boosted by e squared. This is probably the most famous incarnation of the spectrum. 
And at the very high end, there is this very famous, uh, this very famous cutoff. And that cutoff is also known as the GZK cutoff. Very interestingly, so the, the CMB was discovered in 1965, and this GZK cutoff was stipulated only within a year of the discovery of the, of the CMB. Okay, so you can calculate the photon energy threshold, for instance, for gamma plus gamma CMB. This is the same mechanism as is responsible for the GZK cutoff, but with photons, well, it's pretty simple. The, um, you have, so what you're asking is what energy of photon do you need such that the invariant mass of this interaction is at the threshold for E plus E minus, and that's a calculation that you can easily do, as well as the, um, the mechanism which is responsible for the GZK cutoff, which is protons interacting with CMB photons. So proton interacts with a CMB photon, and when you have, so when m squared is equal to m delta squared, and m delta squared is just equal to E proton plus E CMB minus P proton minus P CMB, because of course, we imagine that the proton and the CMB photon are directed in opposite directions. So here's my proton, and here's my CMB photon. And you can just solve this directly and determine that the proton energy, such that the, in, yeah? Squared. Squared, well, thank you. Right, you are. So you can solve this. Uh, very easily, and then of course you find that the energy of the proton, given the fact that the CMB is just equal to K times 2.7K, is about 10 to the 20th electron volts or so. And then you, but that doesn't tell you all the story, because what you want to know, so that tells you if there's a proton, and the proton is swimming through, the proton interacts with the photon, and the photon has an energy of kT, a CMB photon, that you will resonantly produce a delta. But what you want to know is how far away can a proton be produced with that energy before it strikes such a CMB photon and interacts with us, interacts with us. To do that, you need actual data. You need to know what the delta cross-section looks like. And this is what the delta cross section looks like. So this is the delta P. This is the P gamma cross section as a function of invariant mass. This is the uh, delta resonance. And in order to calculate the distance from which we can actually observe a very high energy proton, or the distance required for a high energy proton to interact with the CMB photon through this through this, uh, through this chain, well, it's very simple. You know that the, um, the probability of interaction in the link dx is just equal to n times sigma times dx. dx uh, sigma is the cross section, which is something like uh, 4, and this is in millibarns, 4 times 10 to the minus 3 um, millibarns. A barn, of course, is 10 to the 24th, uh, 10 to, yeah, if a barn is, uh, is in units of uh, centimeters squared. So you can just calculate, and n is the number of photon targets, which is just 400 per cubic centimeter, and of course that tells you that that distance is on the order of 6 megaparsecs. It's a very simple calculation that just follows directly from that, that peak. All right, now what you can do is you can then go ahead and make a compilation plot that shows where you can do gamma ray and proton astronomy. That is to say, given the fact that protons will be absorbed by the CMB through this process at a distance of more than six megaparsecs, what is the kinematic region 
which is accessible to us to do proton astronomy, and similarly for, for photons. So everything here is excluded from our observation of protons. Everything here is excluded from our observation of, of photons. So we can see, um, for instance, protons if they have an energy which is less than, a little bit less than 10 to 20 electron volts and are within this, you know, 8 megaparsec limit or so. Once you get beyond there, of course, what will happen is that you'll get successive interactions until the proton energy falls below that limit. Okay, and then of course, you get, because you get this interaction, because you get P gamma going to delta, the delta will then decay into n pi, or n pi plus, or P pi zero, and if it goes to n pi plus, then the pion gives you a muon and a muon neutrino, which you can hope to measure, and the muon also gives you an electron and um, electron neutrino, muon neutrino. And these are the so-called cosmogenic neutrinos. So the whole idea is that if you see that fall off in the proton spectrum, it must be the case that there are ultra-high energy protons interacting with the CMB. Therefore, there must be neutrinos that you can observe. And that's the rationale for most of these experiments. Okay, and this is just what I, what I talked about. Okay, um, all right, let me talk, what time is it? Okay, let me, let, let me talk concretely about some of the experimentation that, that we do. Um, so we have various experiments in various parts of, of the world, uh, and they're indicated on this map here. Um, one of the, so there's an experiment which is a little bit different. It's not an ICE experiment right now, but we hope that it will be. And it's a little bit different technique-wise, so I wanted to just spend a little bit of time talking about the, um, about, the, uh, about the technique. So these are all experiments that are attempting to measure ultra-high energy cosmic rays or ultra-high energy uh, neutrinos. So this Tara experiment is located in Utah, uh, in the U.S., um, and the idea is as follows: um, you start out with a um, start out with an ultra high energy cosmic ray, and as the cosmic ray intersects the atmosphere, it produces this shower. And at the central air, in the central part of the shower, the ionization density is very high. The ionization density becomes so high that you get a, a charged plasma. And that charged plasma can, in fact, act as a, as a mirror. So if you have a very high energy transmitter, you can reflect cosmic rays off of that shower core. And the advantage of this technique is that it's very inexpensive. And the other advantage is that, in principle, you have a 24-hour duty cycle. There's a disadvantage that I'll talk about in a second. The other advantage of this is that our experiment, our receiver, is located um, very close to the famous Udig fossils quarry, which is among the world's greatest repositories of trilobite fossils, if you remember, if you're ever out there. Okay, so this is what, this is what um, one of the radio receivers looks like. So this is the antenna. So the, the transmitter is over here, uh, about uh, 50 or 60 kilometers away. Um, Stephen uh, is a graduate student of mine who may be here this summer. Sam just left for, uh, he did most of this work, he's just left for um, a postdoc at Daisy. And this is the student from, um, from Mifi in Moscow who spent the summer 
uh, with us. So these are the antennas that we built, and they're very simple dual polarization antennas. And again, the whole thing is out in the desert, so it has to be autonomously powered. It has a power consumption of about 15 watts. That, that all comes from, from solar power. Uh, here is the solar, here are the solar TV panels. All the electronics are in here, and here is the data which is sent back to the telescope array central building, and then is beamed out to our um, to our um, computers in Kansas. So again, this, this is how the whole thing works. You require, or you can only do this experiment if the central ionization region is high enough that it forms a conducting plasma. So you can distinguish two regimes. In the first regime, the ionization density is small, and in that case, if you send a radio signal into that region, that radio signal will just you'll basically just get Thomson scattering off of each one of the individual. It won't be coherent. In the center, however, uh, when the density is large enough, then you form essentially this plasma, which basically acts like a big mirror. So you get a big reflecting mirror in the center, and the cross-section of that reflecting mirror can be quite large, hopefully on the order of 200 square centimeters. Now, there's, as I said before, there's a problem with this that I'll talk about in a second, but that problem can be remedied if we take this entire experiment and move it into Antarctica. Now, the, um, the idea of radar reflections off of plasmas is not new. In fact, people do radar detection of meteors, and this is a, um, a uh, so-called echogram that was taken by one of our, by that guy, Stephen, uh, at the time when there was a meteor shower uh, in, in Kansas. So, in fact, what we were doing here was we were measuring meteors that were interacting about 800 kilometers away. So if I had to draw a diagram of, if I had to draw a diagram of the whole setup, um, so we're here in Kansas. Utah is over here. If you're not familiar with it, Utah is uh, famous because it's the it's the home of the um, uh, the Church of Latter Day Saints, Mormon Church, which you've probably seen them. They're, maybe they're even here in Nova Sibirsk. No, they're not. I've never heard of them. Oh, you never heard of them? I've never heard of both normal and Nova Sibirsk. Oh, you're from normal and Nova Sibirsk. Okay. Well, it's a very particular. It's, it's a specific branch of um, specific church in in America, and their headquarters are in. Um, in Salt Lake City. Um, it's a very wealthy church. Um, Mitt Romney, our great presidential candidate, did not become president. It is um, it's in the church. As is Kip Thorne, if you use his book on gravitation, I don't know if you do, but he's also um, in the church. So, in, um, in Utah, there's a transmitter transmitter antenna, and it's pointed to the east, no, to the west. And our receiver for our experiment, so for this Tara experiment, our receiver is about, um, about 80 kilometers to the west. However, this transmitter, which operates at, in fact, 40 kilowatts, and at a frequency of 54 megahertz. And in fact, this transmitter was just given to us by a television station in Salt Lake City because two years ago, when they made the change from analog to digital television, all of a sudden, there was a lot of hardware that nobody needed anymore. So they gave us this transmitter. It runs at 40 kilowatts. What we did is we set up a second antenna in my friend Tom's farm. It's just sitting out in the field in the middle of a cornfield about 
three kilometers outside of Lawrence, Kansas. And even though the transmitter is pointed west, there is some signal which leaks out the back. And that signal that leaks out the back was large enough that we could see meteors that were interacting 80 kilometers high in the atmosphere over Colorado. So this whole distance is about 1,500 kilometers. So we were seeing meteor reflections over a distance of about 1,500 kilometers. And of course we verified it by just turning the transmitter on and off. Turn the transmitter off, you don't see anything. Turn it back on. Well, it's really remarkable, but in fact you could do this. In fact, in fact, um, this guy Steven, this student, actually wrote a, um, an app for an Android uh, so that if you, if you want to do this, um, so that with a very small antenna, um, it will actually tell you so that what, what the app will do. Everybody's got apps. You guys should get an app so you don't have to go to graduate school. Um, what this app will do is that it takes your GPS coordinates and it has a database of the nearest analog transmitter. So it tells you what the, what the optimal frequency is, even in Nova Sibirsk, in order to do a meteor detection. Um, and then it will go and it will also design for you a little, a, little, um, a little antenna. It tells you where to point it and things work out. It will record um, meteor reflections for you. Anyway, this is how the experiment works. Um, and the, so I won't go, I don't have time to go into the details of this plot, but what I'll tell you is that if I think about this shower developing, this core region, so inside this core region, an ionization is high enough that I get reflections. I form this plasma. And that core region should have a lateral, a transverse scale of about two centimeters and a length of about uh, 100 centimeters. And that's, in, you know, for radar, 200 square centimeters is a pretty big radar reflector. So in principle, this should give us something like one cosmic ray a month. But there's a problem. And I'll get to the problem in a second. So here's, here's what the, this is what the trans, so again, this is all this is all the hardware that was donated to us. This is what our transmitter antenna looks like. It's a so-called phase Diaby array. And the signal that you expect is called a chirp. Um, there must be a word for this in Russian. Is it just called chirp? Chirpy. Chirpy. So this, so this is the sound that a bird makes. Um, here, here. Some birds. And it's called a chirp. Um, and the, and as you can see, remember that we're operating at 54 megahertz. The total time for the shower to go from the very top of the atmosphere to the bottom of the atmosphere is on the order of 10 to the 10 to 10 to 15 microseconds. And if you think about the geometry, here is our receiver, and here is the transmitter. And as the shower is developing, the signal that we're seeing is being Doppler shifted. And the magnitude of the Doppler shift is proportional to the elevation of the shower. When the shower is right above me, the Doppler shift is the largest. When the shower impacts the ground over here, there's zero Doppler shift. So, it starts from a very high frequency and then Doppler shifts to a low frequency, and this is what a Monte Carlo signal would look like. It's a very distinctive signal, and because of that, you can possibly think about doing pattern recognition. Now, one of the things that we have done is to verify that the receiver, so what, what do we have to calibrate on? Well, the obvious source of radio noise at 54 megahertz is the galactic center. So what we've done is we've measured the variation in the um, we've measured the variation in the, the noise temperature of our antenna as a function of time, 
And of course, it should show a, a two pi oscillation in one day because of the fact that the galactic center is rotating around the antenna. And we can compare that with the known location of Sagittarius A star, the galactic center in the sky, and that's, that's this plot. So, the, um, so let's see. So one of these is corresponds to actually the, the data. So this is the actual noise temperature that we measure as a function of time as the Earth is rotating. And the other corresponds to the known phase of the galactic center in the sky, and clearly they overlay with each other. So that verifies that we're actually seeing the galactic center rotate around the sky. That's one of the calibrations that we have. The other thing that we did uh, about five months ago, four months ago, three months ago, is uh, we actually put a, um, a dedicated uh, chirp unit into, into the field, and this is what a, so now we have a transmitter that generates calibration chirps, and that happens every two hours. So this experiment is set up, the only problem with it is that we have no signals. It's bad. Uh, and the reason that we're not seeing signals we understand now is probably because there are two things that are happening. Remember that the entire experiment relies on the presence of this charged plasma that is descending through the atmosphere. And that charged plasma has to be long-lived enough so that we can actually see the reflection. If the charged plasma is very short-lived, then we will not, or if there's something else which is impeding the radar reflections, we will obviously not see a signal. In fact, there are two effects that are causing us to lose signals. One is so-called collisional damping. And as the name suggests, what that means is that in this plasma, you can excite it with uh, a radio signal but you want the response of the plasma to be coherent. If there are gas molecules that are interfering with the, uh, with the motion of your plasma, which of course is the case, then you will lose the ability to see this coherent reflection. So that's the first effect. The second effect is that there's recombination of the plasma. So some of the, so a lot of the charge, a lot of the free charge, these electrons are actually, um, there's a high affinity for oxygen to these, uh, to these electrons, these free electrons. And it's likely that within the time scale, so we need a, a, a plasma that has a lifetime of at least several microseconds. And it's likely that there's a recombination of time scale where these electrons are being grabbed by oxygen atoms, which is on the order of maybe a microsecond or even shorter. And because of that, um, we believe we're not seeing signal. However, you could imagine that you can do the same experiment in ice. And there what you would do in Antarctica is you have a transmitter and a receiver. And now what you would do is you would look for you would look for um, signals that are reflecting off of, for instance, an in ice shower. And in fact, there's a group at um, at Groningen in the Netherlands which has done some tests and is exploring the possibility of doing this. So here you avoid the possibility, for instance, of a recombination. Okay, so that's a, that's a long prelude. Um, there is some gamma ray astronomy that we're in principle also involved with uh, in this Tonka experiment. And here what you're doing is you're looking for air showers that are generated by by, by photons, and again, accompanying those air showers should be a radio signal, and I'll tell you a happy story. 
Uh, here are, so these were two students of mine, Jessica and Mark, uh, when they went out, I guess, five years ago to Tonka Valley to set up this, um, this radio antenna. Um, the cement fence, is it obvious why there's a cement fence here? Any ideas? Cows, yeah, exactly. It turns out the cows evidently uh, have a taste for the um, for the polyethylene, the PVC cladding on on cables. As I learned one night. So one night I'm sitting taking data, and all of a sudden there's no more data. What happened? Well, I look, look my computer's working, everything's plugged in, and uh, I look outside and there's a cow which is just Monging on this, this people. So anyway, so Jessica and Mark went out to Tonka, you know, two kids from Kansas, two kids from, you know, America, and um, they set up this experiment, and then they decided to uh, take a, take your Trans-Siberian uh, train from Irkutsk to Moscow. And then they got to Moscow, and they wrote me and said, oh, we decided to get married. So, I'm married. So these are the dangers of doing cosmic ray astronomy, and to get married. Uh, and these are the two antennas that we set up a while ago. Uh, they've got the wrong problems that I won't go into. Okay. Uh, more photon astronomy. Okay. All right, that's probably enough. So, tomorrow, the last day, I'll start in on neutrino astronomy, which is the main stuff that we do. Um, and I'm not going to have time to go through all this in detail, obviously. But at least I'll give you a flavor of some of the experiments that we do. And, you know, all this stuff is online anyway. Okay?